It's great to join you here today. And of course, tomorrow is Human Rights Day, when we celebrate the gains won for human rights and resolve to carry on the fight to win those human rights that are still denied. So my theme today is really talking about what are human rights, who's entitled to human rights, and how do we push the human rights agenda forward in Britain and around the world. Human rights are a body of principles governing relations between the state and the individual. There are a set of principles which say that there are certain things the state cannot do. There are certain rights that you and I possess that no state has the authority to violate. So human rights are a very important protection for you, for me, for everyone. They set out the restrictions, the limits of state power. And of course, I'm sure you are very familiar with many of the most obvious and best known human rights principles, like freedom of speech and expression, the right to strike and protest, the freedom to not be subject from torture or detention without trial. These are all the fundamental basic principles of human rights. And these ideas have evolved over centuries. They haven't been invented in the last decades. They haven't been invented by the West. They are the evolution of ideas that have sprung out of different cultures in different parts of the world over the last four to five thousand years. Human rights are based upon reason and ethics. They're not God-given, they're man-made. They're ideas that we collectively as humanity have decided should be the rights and freedoms of all of us. Of course, some of the people who contributed to human rights ideas were people of faith. And there are some aspects of faith that have informed human rights principles. But essentially, the principles of human rights are what we collectively as human beings have decided by reason and ethics should be the protections given to everyone on this planet. When you go back in history and think about it, the first humans were hunters and gatherers. For them, rights revolved around their family and nobody else. And even within those families, the power resided with the man, with the father, the husband, over women and children. And then gradually, over centuries, over millennia, that idea of rights extended beyond the family, beyond the immediate mother, father and children, to related tribes and clans. So we had family rights first, then tribal and clan rights, and then gradually that was extended to kingdoms, to nations, and eventually to all of humanity. But that extension to all of humanity has been relatively recent. And even today it is disputed in many countries and many cultures. So there are many countries that say, for example, that if you don't follow a particular religion, you should be punished and persecuted. They don't accept freedom of religion or belief. There are many countries that do not accept freedom of political belief. They say if you don't follow our politics, the politics of our state, you shall be punished and suffer. So human rights today are still in contention. But they are no longer confined to particular families, tribes, clans, nations, classes, faiths or political systems. They are universal. <coughs> 
And that universality is enshrined in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was written and agreed in 1948. Now many people, or some people think, that human rights are a Western invention. But in fact, the people who drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights came from many different countries, cultures, faiths and political systems. Despite their differences, they collectively agreed that these rights should apply to every human being on earth, with no exceptions, no exclusions. I mentioned that human rights are not a modern invention. If you go back to ancient Persia, in the 6th century BC, the Persian ruler Cyrus devised an embryonic concept of human rights. He decided as a ruler of Persia that the citizens of Persia should have certain inalienable rights that there were certain things that he, as the ruler, should not be allowed to do. And you can go to the British Museum in London and see the Cyrus Cylinder, where those principles of human rights were inscribed and agreed way back in the 6th century BC. And then look back to ancient India, to the second and third centuries BC, when Ashoka was the ruler, the warlord, the tyrant, had a conversion. He converted to Buddhism and decided to completely reshape the way he governed his Indian kingdom. To put aside war and militarism, to promote peace and understanding between peoples, of different faiths and different ethnicities. These were very important, fundamental human rights ideas. And you can go to India and see the great Ashoka Declaration, which even to this day has a relevance and pertinence for people not just in India, but everywhere. Here in Britain, we forced the king to accede to some basic human rights ideas with the Magna Carta in 1215. Well, when I say we, it was primarily the barons, the barons who wanted more say in the running of the country, but their demand was supported by many ordinary people. The peasantry of England supported the principles of the Magna Carta. Prior to that time, the king in England had absolute power. He was a tyrant, a dictator. He could do whatever he wanted. There were no restraints. But the barons and the people said no. The king must be subject to key principles like the rule of law, which should apply to the king as well as everyone else, to the right of not being arbitrarily detained without trial, the basic principles of habeas corpus. These were the embryos of human rights as well. And then later in the 1700s, we see further developments of human rights with the American Declaration of Independence in 1776. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created free and equal. In the US Constitution, of 1787 with the Bill of Rights. Again, though, that principle was enshrined. The United States may not have always lived up to that principle, but it established the principle which still holds true today and which American citizens <laughs> still use to challenge arbitrary unjust authority. It was used by the black civil rights movement to overturn racial segregation in the southern states in the 1950s and 60s. It's been used by the LGBT community 
to challenge the criminalization of same-sex relations and the ban on same-sex marriage. So the Bill of Rights of 1789 in the United States still has a relevance even today. In the same year, 1789, the French Republic, the revolutionary French Republic, published the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, which again espoused basic human rights principles summed up in the slogan, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. And so the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights was a culmination of all those historic movements in many different countries to give people basic fundamental human rights. In 1950, in the wake of the Second World War and the horrors of Nazism, European countries came together to enact the European Convention on Human Rights, which again reiterated that all European peoples, no matter who they are, no matter what their background, have certain inviolable, inalienable rights. Then in 1966, the United Nations passed the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which expanded on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to establish further guarantees for political and civil liberty freedom. And the same year, we also had the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights agreed by the United Nations. What's very important about the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Convention is that it recognizes that human rights are more than just the right to speak your mind or the right to not be tortured. It said that economic rights are human rights. So the right to food, clean water, shelter, education and healthcare, these two are human rights. Yet today, this morning, 800 million people woke up with no safe, clean drinking water. And thousands of them will die today because of dirty water. One billion people on this planet are today hungry, malnourished, and even starving in some countries on the verge of death. 1,000 million. This too is a violation of human rights. Then when we look at the outrageous inhumanities and barbarities in Syria today, we should also remember that in 1949, the United Nations agreed the Geneva Conventions which said absolutely clearly that certain acts in war are prohibited. That the killing of prisoners, the torture of prisoners, is a war crime. That it's a war crime to indiscriminately bomb civilian areas. Lights like happening as we speak now in Aleppo. These are war crimes under the Geneva Conventions. That convention was passed in 1949. The preceding year, in 1948, the United Nations passed the Genocide Convention, which in reaction to the genocide against predominantly the Jewish people of Europe by the Nazis, but also other ethnic groups were targeted as well, the Genocide Convention outlawed the deliberate attempt to exterminate certain communities. And in 1984, there was the Convention Against Torture, which prohibited the torture of people by the state or by private citizens. It recognized that torture is a crime against humanity. In 1998, we had the Rome Treaty, another UN convention which established the International Criminal Court. 
which establish the mechanisms by which state officials who violate human rights, who commit war crimes or crimes against humanity can be held to account, can be put on trial. And many of you will know that over the years, people like Charles Taylor of Liberia and Slobodan Milosevic in the former Yugoslavia were arrested and put on trial either through the International Criminal Court or through special United Nations tribunals. Now, of course, the UN conventions are not perfect. And in particular, when it comes to enforcement, they clearly often fail. You know, witness the mass killing in the Darfur region of Sudan a decade or so ago, where hundreds of thousands of civilians were oppressed, persecuted, killed, and bombed. Wholesale massacres. We don't yet have a perfect, effective mechanism for the enforcement of these ideals. And many countries in the world today blatantly violate them. You think about the United States war on terror and the way in which the United States resorted to extraordinary rendition. You know, the literally kidnapping of terror suspects, bundling them into planes and taking them to places where they were tortured to extract confessions. And then putting them in Guantanamo Bay without any charges or any trial, violating all the principles of human rights and the rule of law. Here in Britain, in the 1970s, 80s and 90s, British troops in Northern Ireland were involved in many serious human rights abuses against suspected Republican and IRA sympathizers. And there's evidence of widespread collusion between the British state and loyalist death squads who targeted Catholics and Republicans, including lawyers and journalists and social activists, for torture and sometimes even extrajudicial execution. So the West is not perfect. It's not as if the West is great and the West, rest of the world is terrible. That's not the way it is. We too have made our own errors and violations. Now, that brings me to the question about, are there any exceptions to human rights? Are there any circumstances when human rights law can be voided or set aside? Uh, is it true that terrorists have human rights? Yes, they do. Terrorists have human rights. So do rapists and child sex abusers. Horrendous though their crimes may be, they have human rights. Of course, if they have committed a crime, and there is evidence for that crime, they should be taken to a place of law, they should be put on trial, and they should be duly punished according to law. But they shouldn't be shot dead in the street, or lynched by a mob, or subjected to torture. That would be a violation of their human rights, and the very important principle that a person is innocent until proven guilty. So even though we have terrible people doing terrible things, in a society based on human rights and the rule of law, we don't violate their human rights, mostly. Sometimes we do, but mostly we don't. Mostly we recognize that even heinous crimes do not merit the use of torture because torture is a violation of human rights. Do people have a right to uh, say things that people of faith find offensive? Yes, they do. People have a right to ridicule and mock religions or political ideas. Any ideas should be open to scrutiny and challenge. I wouldn't advise people to deliberately cause offense, but if someone has a particular objection to 
a religious idea, a political idea, to any idea, of course they have a right to criticize it, to challenge it, to say it's wrong. And the people who hold those ideas have an equal right to challenge those people. The best way to deal with these issues is by open debate. By letting people say what they want, providing they don't incite violence, and then showing why they're wrong. You will, of course, recall not long ago that for many years the British government tried to um, detain and place under restriction an alleged Islamist terrorist, Abu Qatada. He said and allegedly did some pretty awful things, but it was never proven in a court of law. So even though I strongly objected to his Islamist extremist ideas, I defended his right to be subject to the rule of law and not to be arbitrarily detained without trial and not to be tortured. I was involved in the campaign to free Sheikh Ahmad from Guantanamo Bay. He had been taken there, tortured, and held without trial, I think, for 13 years. That goes against the principles of human rights and the rule of law, which say that a person has a right to swift, effective justice, that no one should be held without trial. Now, I've got to put my hand on my heart. I don't know whether Sheikh Arma was guilty of any of the things that the Americans alleged. But I do know they never produced any evidence they never charged him, and therefore he had a right to go free. And eventually, I think after 13 years, through the campaign that I and many others were involved in, Sheikh Ahmad was freed from Guantanamo Bay and finally came back to Britain. The only circumstances where human rights can be legitimately limited, as enshrined in human rights law, is when there is a grave threat to national security, when there's a grave threat to public health, and even then the restrictions must be necessary and proportionate and only be maintained for as long as necessary. So for example, with the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa or bird flu in Asia, it was legitimate, temporarily, for countries and states to restrict the movements of infected people in order to prevent a small outbreak becoming a national and even global pandemic which would threaten the lives of millions. So that was a fair restriction of human rights and it was only temporary. As soon as those people became well and were no longer infectious, they were free to carry on their lives as normal. So those are examples of when human rights may be legitimately restricted. Just finally, I'd like to perhaps talk about Syria, which is the great humanitarian crisis of our time, where we have seen some of the most grotesque human rights abuses since the Nazi era. In Syria, in Syria, the research by human rights organizations suggests that somewhere in excess of 200,000 civilians have been killed. That's the known number killed. The real figure is likely to be much higher, but over 200,000. Of those, at least 20,000 children. At least 20,000 children. And the research shows that 96% of all those killings have been perpetrated by the regime of President Bashar al-Assad. Some have been perpetrated by IS, but only about 1%. On the other 3%, a combination of other Islamists like the Al-Nusra Front, the Kurdish fighters, and some by the international coalition led by the US.
The international human rights conventions I talked about were there to protect civilians. But quite clearly, the United Nations has failed. Over 11 million Syrians are refugees. Almost 12% of the entire population of Syria has been killed or injured in the fighting. And how did it begin? We sometimes forget. It began because the Syrian people en masse protested peacefully in the streets to demand democracy and human rights against the Assad dictatorship. And Assad responded by using his police and army to shoot them dead. A clear violation of human rights. Now the situation is complicated by the advent of Islamic State and other Al-Qaeda affiliated type groups. But let's not forget today in Syria there are hundreds of thousands of Syrians who are still fighting for democracy and human rights. They are not involved in any violence. They simply want democracy. And in Aleppo today, yes, there are some rebels, even some Islamists, but the vast majority of people in Aleppo, east and west, are civilians. Civilians who want equal human rights for all. There are hundreds of thousands of Syrians involved in their local communities through what is called the Local Coordination Committees. These are grassroots organizations, civic organizations, that spring up, have sprung up in towns and villages all across Syria where the Assad regime has been forced out. They're like local municipalities, like local councils. People have come together to run the services for the people. They are Syrian Democrats socialists, liberals, anti-war activists. Why is it we never hear their story in the Western media? These people are still fighting for the same democratic human rights principles they fought for way back in 2011. We should never ever forget them. They are true heroes of human rights. Thousands of them have paid with their lives. Doctors and medical workers, teachers, the white helmets, the civil rescue teams that go in to bombed buildings to save the people who have been buried under the rubble of Assad's and Putin's bombs. These people are living examples of human rights defenders. They risk their lives and liberty to defend the principles of human rights as enshrined in the United Nations Conventions. We need to find a way to reform the United Nations, to ensure that there are no more Syrias. Of course, we've been there before. We, we said, no more Yugoslavia, no more Rwanda, no more Darfur. But it keeps on happening over and over and over again. And one of the problems is that the power in the United Nations resides with the Security Council. And if any one member decides to veto UN action, then nothing can be done. Except that, except that, in 1950, the United Nations passed Uniting for Peace, Resolution 377A, which said that if the Security Council fails to act against breaches of peace, the General Assembly by a two-thirds vote has the right to override the Security Council. The question is, why has 377A never been invoked in all these years of the Syria war? Why have we allowed Russia and sometimes China to veto humanitarian aid to besieged areas? to mandate a no-bombing zone, to provide civilian safe havens. Now Canada has just got 73 countries to sign up to Uniting for Peace, to demand a special emergency UN General Assembly 
and it's backed by over 200 human rights NGOs from around the world. It's great, but why has it taken six years? And why do the major countries, East and West, fail to sign up to that? Human rights means nothing if we don't enforce it and uphold it. In my view, human rights trumps national sovereignty. Just because a nation state exists doesn't mean it can do whatever it wants to its people. And that applies to Britain and the United States as much as Syria, Zimbabwe, Iran or any other country. Human rights come first because we are all part of the same human family. An injustice to someone in Syria is an affront and an injustice to all of us. If we allow those injustices to perpetrate in any country, that gives a license to tortures and tyrants everywhere. We have to take a stand and say that we as a global community will stand together with all those who suffer abuses of human rights wherever they are. We have to reform the United Nations and make sure there is a mechanism that there are no more Syrias in future. Thank you very much.